Okay, it looks like we've got quite a few participants in our Zoom call, so we'll get started. Hi everyone, I'm Diana Stasco and I'm the 2022 Chair for the Alliance for Disability Access, which is a UC Berkeley staff org. Um, I'm going to put a link to our web page in the chat. If you are not already aware of, um, uh, of our organization, you can go to this link and find out a little bit more about us. And if you would like to be on our email list, um, you can email sada at berkeley.edu. I will also put that in our chat. So um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Today we will be presenting a webinar from Derek Coates on planning accessible events. Derek is Campus Manager of Disability Program Access and lead on the campus-wide program Access Self-Assessment. And we will be starting with a 33-minute video presentation from Derek. This is a pre-recorded presentation, which will be followed by um, some remarks from Derek and a 15-minute Q&A. Um, so without further ado, we will get started with our presentation. Hi, my name is Dr. Derek Coates. I am the manager of ADA program access in the Office of Disability Access and Compliance. I use he and his pronouns, and this workshop focuses on planning accessible events at UC Berkeley. The goal of this workshop is to help everyone understand how to plan events that are welcoming and inclusive and accessible. We begin with the ADA Title II requirements for accessibility that require that everyone that produces events and activities on the campus provide equal access to people with disabilities. Some people have planned hundreds of events and others have never planned one event. So this workshop is designed to help people understand how to plan accessible events on our campus. Some people have participated in the interactive process in responding to requests for accommodations. Others don't even know what the interactive process is. So that's where our starting point will be. Everyone who requests an accommodation is entitled to engage in the interactive process. And this means that we don't want people who receive accommodation requests telling people, hell no, never. Uh, hell no, never is a phrase that was coined a long time ago for situations in which people don't interactively discuss the ways that accommodations are possible. Uh, and we want to go the other direction. And the reason why is we want our campus to be welcoming and inclusive. There are two keys to creating accessible events. One is providing effective communication. The second is ensuring that the site is accessible. All events involve communication. This ranges from advertising and promotions to presentations and speeches. Promotional information is disseminated through a variety of modalities that include websites, email messages, newspapers, periodicals, flyers, and posters. All advertisements at UC Berkeley need to have a statement that includes contact information for a person to request an accommodation. We're going to call this person the Access Coordinator. This person is designated to respond to requests for accommodation and required to acquire the name, the contact information, and the specific accommodation that's being requested. Please understand that there are people who are adventitiously disabled that may not know what accommodation they need, in which case you can always contact our office and ask questions or refer that person to our office and we can speak to them and identify what the best next steps are. Effective communications during the event is also critical to success. There are speeches and audiovisual presentations, in which people use slides, movies, printed materials, etc. There are um, flyers that may be thrown in or even posters for that matter. Event planners know that one of the ways that you publicize your event is to provide multiple ways of communicating to the people that you're trying to, to uh, invite to your event. Effective communication also reinforces the messaging and provides lessons for diverse audiences. Accessibility enables everyone to be on an equal playing field. Captions provide access to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Audio descriptions provide access to people who may have visual disabilities or are blind. 
all of our websites must be compliant with ADA Title II requirements and that means that they must adhere to WC3 guidelines. Regarding site assessments, it's critical to make sure that everyone knows how to arrive to the campus to attend the meeting or how to reach the meeting via a Zoom URL. And when we think about site access, we think about public parking, we think about routes to buildings where the events are taking place, we think about routes to the rooms where the event is happening. To get that information, we can refer people to the DAC website at which they can identify the building where they're going to attend the event and they can learn about the accessibility features of that event. Those accessibility features include designated waiting areas for evacuation. They include routes to buildings from public parking lots or from a particular street location. They include routes inside of buildings from the entrance to the building to the room where the event is taking place as well as to accessible restrooms. Allowing a person to be empowered to identify these routes and plan their method of arriving at the meeting is critical to our success. We need to make sure that accessibility is built in to our emergency evacuation planning and this usually means that if people are having an in-person event the event sponsor needs to know where the evacuation signage is located and if there is a person who may need assistance it's their obligation to go to that person introduce themselves and ask if they need assistance in an evacuation we call this a buddy system and the event sponsor is responsible for ensuring that a buddy is assigned in case there is an emergency. It's critical to not be too pushy on this. Some people are okay with it, some people are not okay with it. So if you approach a person and you ask them if they need assistance and they snap at you, you just tell them to have a nice day and as long as you know where the evacuation designated waiting area is, that's what we'd like to have happen. But uh, it really helps when you approach people and say hello and introduce yourself uh, as an event sponsor and then ask them if they need assistance. Uh, in an emergency, elevators may not work. And so having an exit buddy can be very, very helpful. And please be mindful that in designated waiting areas, there are communication systems that are available for people to use in case of an emergency. In terms of room accessibility, we want people to think about and think through how the arrangement of the chairs or furniture in the room can impact the person who may be using a wheelchair or have some other type of mobility device or have a service animal. I can remember going to conferences with my service animal, with my guide dog, and I walk into the room after receiving sighted guide assistance to the location. Uh, with the service animal, with the guide dog, you can't tell the guide dog take me to the corner store. The guide dog goes left, right, forward. So it's critical that um, I get assistance to the room if I'm not familiar with the location. And this means that if I contact you and I say, hey, I want to attend your event, this means that I am going to ask you who can meet me outside the building at the entrance and then can sighted guide me to the room and then help me get to a seat. So we walk into the room and I don't know what the room layout is but the person who's the event sponsor or who's sighted guiding me does. And so what I'm going to tell them is I'd like to sit in a location that is a place where my dog will not get stepped on by people. So if I'm in a conference regardless of the seating area what I will usually do is go to the end of a row and take a seat out so that I can have my dog lay down next to me on the right of me. And so that's just an example of when you're in a physical space, ways that you can assist a person with a disability in gaining access and being able to participate in the event. With mobility devices, the same thing. Or with the person who's using a wheelchair. It may be great to just pull the chair out of the space and have them move their chair into the space. What we don't want is we don't want the wheelchair users and the people with service animals being seated in the back of the room unless they ask for it. There may be times when I enter into a conference session or a meeting room that's packed and I might not want to be bothered with walking all the way down the middle of the aisle to find a seat that's four seats deep into a row. 
What I might prefer is to, to ask the person, is there a seat in the back? And sometimes I do like to sit in the back against the back wall because I can have my dog right in front of me and I can sort of control how people access the dog because sometimes I can move the dog underneath the seat a little bit and put my foot out so that they have to avoid my foot instead of walking into the dog. There may be a need to provide somebody who's blind with assistance to go to where the restroom is. There may need to be assistance with stairs in terms of placing my hand on the handrail and notifying me about whether the steps are going up or down. The whole point is that there needs to be consideration of the unique aspects of people with disabilities. Not every disability is the same or impacts people in the same way. When we think about considerations for the actual spacing at an activity or an event, we do want to consider if a person with a wheelchair has indicated they will be participating, how the seats are arranged in that location. This also can mean considering whether booths are arranged in a certain way and even the use of accessible signage to notify people about where uh, activities are taking place. What we want you to do is think about your displays and whether they're accessible to people in wheelchair users or anyone else with a mobility disability. Access coordinators have a great job because they have an opportunity to make these arrangements and have it go smoothly and produce a wonderful event. Now again, the point is that we want to emphasize we want our events to be welcoming and inclusive at UC Berkeley. And when you have thought through how to provide accommodations and taken into consideration what kind of services you may be able to provide, it makes people feel welcoming. When you include them by allowing them to participate and even contribute by making the materials accessible to people with disabilities, it demonstrates how inclusive we are as a campus. The role of access coordinators is to understand all of the details of an event so that if there are changes or adjustments that need to be made, they are authorized to make them. This includes the logistics in terms of arriving at the location, in addition to the timing of the event, in addition to the agenda. True accessibility starts before the event and continues throughout the event. It begins before the person registers to even attend the event. We don't require proof of a disability, so if I walk into your event with my guide dog, I don't want to be asked, is that a guide dog? I don't want to be asked if that is a guide dog if I have a harness on the guide dog. You can ask two questions with the service animal. You can ask, is this a service animal? And you can ask, what task does it perform? When I walk into a, a place, the person can see me holding the harness on the dog, and maybe they've never seen a harness before. But again, the point is, we want to ask, do you need assistance? The words you use impact the way people experience your event. So what we want is we want people to use person-first language. Some people prefer person-first language. Some people prefer identity-first language. Person-first language would be person with a disability, person who is blind. Identity-first language would be deaf person or blind person. But it's best to ask people what their preference is. And again, you're going to hear me say a number of times, just ask. Just say hello. Greet the person politely and ask, do you need assistance? How would you prefer for me to refer? In fact, the idea of having to refer to the person at all in either of the person first or identity first terms really doesn't make sense if you're providing accommodations on site because they have a name and we can just call them by their name, right? That's what we want to do. And that's also how we demonstrate being welcoming and inclusive. We want our advertisements to be accessible that's another way of demonstrating how we are welcoming and how we are inclusive. We want to confirm our websites are accessible by using Open Berkeley. We want to make sure that the presenters are able to provide content before the event upon request that is also in an accessible format. We want to make sure that if a person comes in and they need sighted guide assistance or they need someone to read to them, they have someone available that can do that. We want to make sure that when a person attends the event and they need sighted guide assistance, someone is available to provide that. That is already arranged. When I call in and I say I need sighted guide assistance and they indicate they don't know what I mean, 
that tells me that they're really not aware of what it's like to guide a person who's blind to a seat. So my job is to make sure that all of you understand that that's one of the tasks that we want to perform so that we can make sure that our programs and services are welcoming and inclusive for people with disabilities. Now I'm going to say welcoming and inclusive 400 times during this workshop for a reason because we have the opportunity to create a campus that is and does demonstrate those two constructs. In terms of our vendors, on our campus we use two vendors for our services. There are other units on campus that provide American Sign Language video remote interpretation and they use other vendors and there are units on our campus that provide live captioning remote services and they may use a different vendor too. On our campus we use two vendors named LinguaB and Aberdeen. We use LinguaB for ASL video remote interpretation and we use Aberdeen for real-time live captioning. We connect you with the vendors who are going to provide the services. And this means that we have a mechanism by which you can submit a request for services and once you provide that information, I will process that information and we will provide you with a vendor that can provide the services. You're welcome to consult with our office for any part of the planning regarding your event. We will review the promotional materials that you have to confirm that they're accessible. We will provide you with specific information that will help ensure your event is accessible. We will connect you with other campus resources that might be available to provide access to the event. We will give you explanations of our campus policy if there are questions about our events. Uh, recently, I received a question about the LinguaB interpreters, whether they were certified and whether they were going to work as a group to provide access services. You may receive questions about that, and you're not expected to be a walk-in encyclopedia of this domain, so feel free to contact us and follow up and ask, and we'll provide you with that information. We'll provide you with the support that you need in order to satisfy the questions that you may receive from people that need access. We fund some events and activities, and there's a criteria that must be met in order for us to fund those activities. And this is a critical question for uh, access coordinators who are new to the process and may not understand how our process works. Essentially, after we schedule and arrange the services and the event takes place, we encumber the funds and pay for the services with the vendor. And then, if the criteria for funding is not met by the event, then we will send a recharge form to the event sponsor and have that recharge processed. In order to qualify for funding for events using our services, the event must be sponsored by a campus unit or department. The event must be broadly open to the campus community or the broader campus. The event must be located on a campus property or organized through a remote Zoom or Google Meet account. You must have the specific name and contact information for the person who's requesting the access services and you must not charge for admission. Now, the charge for admission portion, please contact me if you do charge for admission because there are some conditions under which funding can be provided depending on what the charge is used to cover. We provide logistical support for you to connect with vendors and to schedule your event, but we do not hire the service providers. The service providers are hired by the agency that we use to provide the services. That means that when you submit your request and there's a change in the communications request form that we provide for you to give us the information, you need to communicate that directly to the vendor. So now I'm going to talk about how to request accommodations. Uh, the first rule of this service is that we do not provide accommodations for students who are taking courses. So if your event is an event that is sponsored by a department that's connected to a course in which the student is going to receive credit for that course, then we do not fund that. That student needs to go to the Disabled Students Program and request communication access services as an accommodation from the Disabled Students Program. We provide remote and on-site ASL interpretation services. The way that you arrange services with our unit is by submitting a communication request form. Once you submit the communication request form, 
that form is sent to me and I will evaluate the information that you've provided in the form, confirm that all of the information is there, and then submit that to the vendor for processing on their end. We have designed our communication form to be consistent with the fields that are requested by the vendors. When you access the communication request form, you will find that it is a Google form that spans multiple pages. The point is, is that all of the questions on this form are based on the information that the vendors require us to provide in order to schedule services. So um, we've had situations in which people are concerned about the questions, but what I want to assure you is that each one of the questions that we ask is based on requests from the vendors so that they can provide the most appropriate and effective access services. Once you submit a communication access request form, I will send you an acknowledgement. In this acknowledgement, I greet you and the vendor. If the event takes place within three days, then I also put a note in the acknowledgement to notify the vendor that this is a rush request. We say seven to 10 days advance notice because that's what the vendor's policy is. However, we actually will serve requests that come in between three and five days. Please understand that if a request arrives three days before an event, the guarantee of services decreases exponentially. The reason why is that many of these vendors book their services two weeks in advance. That's why they want the seven to 10 day advance notice. There are times when a person can submit a request and there just may happen to be a caption writer available or an ASL interpreter available that can provide services in under three days, but it's rare. And given the volume of services we provide, it is advisable that if your event is occurring within three days, you notify the person that the late notice may be challenging. Event sponsors don't always have a lot of control over when a person submits a request to attend an event for communication access services. We understand that. What we're obligated to do is make a good faith effort. We do our best to try to find out if somebody is available. I am responsible for responding to requests for communications access within one business day. Uh, and that doesn't mean that if you send it to me at 9 o'clock on a Friday night, that and the event is on Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I'm going to be able to process it. So what we want to do is get as much advance notice as possible. But if it's the case that you receive a request that is under seven days, don't fret or worry. Submit the request and we will see if the vendor can provide the services. Um, we've had situations in which they've been able to provide the services in three days with no problem and situations in which they were unable to provide the services. When you receive the acknowledgement from me after submitting the communication request form, I will first ask you to confirm all the information that you've placed into the form is accurate and correct. I will then make sure that you are actually submitting a request. This is something that you do want to do. Then I will ask you to review the remote access instructions that we provide to you so that you can help the host of the event, especially if it's a Zoom event, um, connect the ASL interpreter or the captioner to the event so that they can provide services. Prior to the event, please send any materials that are going to be used in the event to the vendor. I will send the vendor an acknowledgement of your request for services. and in doing so, the vendor will respond and let you know whether they are able to book the services or not. It's at this point that we want you to begin thinking about the information that needs to be sent to the vendors. This includes an agenda, a list of speakers, a list of content that's going to be provided in an accessible print format. If you have videos, audio visual, or movies that you're going to be using, they need to be captioned. If you have uh, event sponsors that are going to be talking, we want to make sure that if they're giving speeches, those speeches are provided ahead of time. So any print materials that will be used, we want to be provided to the captioners or the ASL interpreters so that they can become familiar with the material.
If you're hosting a two or three day conference, we want to make sure that on that agenda you itemize exactly what events you want captioned or what events you want the ASL interpreter to provide access for. And so it's very critical that the communication remain open between you and the vendor so that they understand exactly what's being expected of them. Please note that you will have to connect with the vendors 15 minutes before the meeting in order to make sure that access is provided in remote access meetings. For the ASL interpreters, this helps so that you can establish what the logistics are in terms of who may be providing services first, if there are two interpreters, who may be going second, who needs to be spotlighted first, etc. When it comes to providing live remote captionings, it's important that 15 minutes ahead of time standard be adhered to because there may be an inability to engage remote captioned access. In the document that I provide you with that provides instructions on how to connect the captioner or the ASL interpreter to a web meeting, um, I provide you with step-by-step -step ways to accomplish that task. So one of the documents that I will be sending to you is the remote access checklist. We want to make sure that you refrain from asking who the person is that is requesting the services at the event. Some people with disabilities don't want to be contacted when they request communications access. So this means that communicating with them after the fact may be problematic for them. So some people don't want to be known as the person who's requesting the access. So we need to honor their privacy. The checklist that I've provided is designed to assist you in making sure that we have a smooth transition and are able to provide a successful event. The checklist is designed to provide the access coordinator with the means of ensuring that people have communications access to the event. The first section of the remote instructions focuses on providing ASL interpreters with access to the event. This includes creating the web meeting, sending the invitation, spotlighting the interpreter, and confirming that the interpreter can be seen by the person who needs to access the communication taking place. In this instruction document, I provide you with step-by-step -step ways that you can provide that access and ensure that the connection is successful. The second section of this remote instruction document focuses on providing caption writers with access to the event. So again, we're talking about creating the event, sending the caption writer Aberdeen a panel invitation to the event, identifying the time and date, confirming that everyone is on the same page, and then 15 minutes before the event takes place, opening the meeting and communicating with the caption writer. What we want you to do is engage the captions so that the captions can be inserted into the panel and be accessible. Um, and that requires providing the caption writer with an API token. Once this token is acquired, the caption writer can access the panel in the meeting and you should be able to confirm that captions are readable within the panel. Again, the 15 minutes prior to event time is critical to the success of this partnership. Please do not engage the automatic captioning system. The automatic captioning system, when engaged, does not allow the caption writer to be able to directly insert content into the caption panel. On this document, we also provide instructions about how to do that without engaging the automatic captioning system. The last portion of this document focuses on providing access to captions using YouTube. If you have any questions about any of the instructions on this document, you're more than welcome to reach out to our office and we will assist you in being able to understand what your role is and what needs to take place. In general, if it's 15 minutes before the event and you're working with the captioner or the ASL interpreter, they've engaged in this process enough times to be able to talk you through and walk you through what needs to take place. But the reason why we've added instructions on not including the AI captioning is because sometimes that can happen and it delays the ability of the caption writer to provide access to the content when the event starts.
In addition, we will provide you with program access best practices and tips. We have a number of suggestions that you can provide to presenters so that they're able to enable effective communication. For example, we want people to make the presentations clear and simple. It would be beneficial to give an overview of what is being presented before the presentation and a summary at the end of the presentation. It would be a great idea to provide verbal access to images, pictures that are referenced in the talk that's taking place. If acronyms or jargon is used, please explain what the meaning is. Keep hands and other objects away from your mouth because they may block the audio signal from the microphone. Um, there's nothing like being in a meeting and somebody's talking about a graph and they're saying over here or over there. And I'm in the back saying, well, where's here? <laughs> you know, I can't see it. Um, and I don't want to embarrass them. So generally what happens is I don't say anything. That's called not having access. So what we want to do is make sure that you notify presenters that if there's somebody who has a visual disability or is blind involved or participating in their event, that if they are going to be talking about graphs, they need to provide an audio description of the content. We want to make sure that all print materials, papers, PowerPoints, agendas, Google Slides, are all accessible prior to the event. Generally, what will happen is if a person who's blind wants to access content and request the accommodation, they'll ask before the event begins. And they will ask to be sent an accessible document. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting and had somebody not provide that information and continue to talk about graphs or talk about numbers in columns. And again, the general point is that I'd like to participate. People want to participate. People want to contribute. And in fact, the reason why they're attending is so that they can contribute. So we want to make sure that any kind of media that's being used is available and accessible. This includes using multiple communication methods for different communication styles. So we have a large number of recommendations that can be provided to presenters so that they can make their content of their presentations accessible. And if there are any questions, again, you're welcome to contact our office and connect us with a presenter who may not know how to make their content accessible. We have a number of resources on our website that provide people with information on how to make accessible Word documents, accessible PDFs, accessible PowerPoint presentations, accessible Google Slide presentations, and we're able to provide people with instruction on how to provide accessible print access. Please allow recording of meetings as an accommodation. Allow for breaks in case people need to relieve service animals or for other reasons, use the restrooms. All of these extra steps enable us to provide people with disabilities access to all of our campus activities and events. So now I'm going to talk about some of the frequently asked questions and some of the ways that the system can uh, be interrupted. One of the first is when we start with the communication access request form and we have somebody who submitted a request very, very late. It's challenging to process, but we do our best to do so. Another problem is when the communication access request form is not completely filled out. So the person may not have indicated a certain area or information that's critical to being able to provide the services. What this does is make me have to connect with you again and ask the question. And it could be through email and that can be very problematic in terms of time consuming, especially if the event is happening quickly. Other concerns that people raised are about the funding and whether funding is available for their event. Again, we provide the checklist so event sponsors can look at that checklist and determine whether or not their event qualifies for funding. Other issues are regarding how to provide access for people that are not blind or not deaf but may have mobility disabilities and may have problems arriving at the location of the event. In that event, you can connect that person with us and we can assist them in helping them plot a route to be able to reach that event. 
Now, I know earlier I said that the form span, the CR form, the communications request form spans several pages. It's really not several pages. It just is on the interface. If you looked at the form and all the questions, it would really just fit on one page. So you're not going to get a thousand questions. Uh, two more points. Number one, if people want to um, request both ASL interpretation and captioning, we want you to submit two different forms, not one form in which you request both. Um, also, for those events in which there's going to be multiple activities on one day, or let's say that the event spans two or three days, we want to itemize agenda with um, each service request itemized in that agenda so that the vendors know to assign people and how to assign people, how to manage breaks, et cetera. Um, next month, I will be providing some podcast material that will walk people through the various forms that we use to provide access and, and hopefully get some testimonials by people who have used the service with no problem and uh, just to reassure people that um, it's, it's welcoming and, uh, and successful. Um, in addition, I've provided some links that uh, will be, I hope will be added to the chat. Uh, and that those links are two pages on our website that were discussed in the, in the talk. One is the Planning Accessible Events website. Um, the second is Communications Account, and that, that, sorry, Planning Accessible Events provides an overview of the entire process. Um, communications Accommodations link provides information about the two uh, extraordinary vendors that we've been working with very successfully over time. Um, there's also the remote communications checklist, which I will also be updating, but uh, that is what I send along with the acknowledgement memo when I arrange the services for uh, the vendors to provide services. Uh, and then the general, um, the, the general accommodation presentation uh, information that's provided to people who are presenting at the various uh, uh, events. So thank you very much for uh, attending the talk. And um, I really enjoy providing services to the campus and making sure that people have equal access to our programs, activities, and events and services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. That was such a detailed, informative, and nuanced presentation. Very much appreciated. Um, I just wanted to mention that this event has been recorded and captioned and the event video will be available in the future. Um, we will open up our Q&A in a moment, but um, I just wanted to mention that if you are interested in being notified of our future events and also notified when um, the event video is available, you can email sada at berkeley.edu, and I'm popping that into the chat. Um, you can also request to be put on the Alliance for Disability Access email list to get updates on more events and resources for the campus community of accessibility. And wanted to also mention that we have our general meetings every third Wednesday from noon to 1 p.m. And these are for, um, you know, uh, uh, it's a staff orgs, but it is also for, um, you know, allies of folks with disabilities or the accessibility community. So you can go to this um, link here to see our web page for our, our events. Um, we will now begin our Q&A. Um, please, rather than put your question in the chat, if you can raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, and uh, we will take questions in the order received. Um, and I think maybe I will start with a question, which is that I see many events um, being promoted that kind of circumvent the Berkeley events page um, which does have that accessibility coordinator requirement. Um, this is often done with affiliated research centers or student orgs, and they have no information listed with um, information about accessibility coordinator. How can we encourage and make sure that people putting on events or orgs putting on events include the right language and are aware of, of the need for an accessibility coordinator? I think one of the ways is to have the sponsoring units make that a priority. 
So for example, with the self-evaluation that was conducted on, uh, for the campus last year that was completed last year, one of the things that will be happening is I will be circulating the campus and meeting with leaders of various colleges and, and units and departments. And we will be reviewing how they performed in terms of their self-assessment of their compliance with ADA Title II standards. Uh, one of the areas in that self-evaluation was events access. So I will be talking through with them how they can make their events more accessible. And that begins with having sort of a central place where communication be, can be disseminated to all the various programs and services that are made available through that unit. So uh, one of the primary goals is to make sure that people understand and hear it from their supervisors and managers, and that it becomes an integral part of how they um, conduct services on the campus and provide service to, to our campus and campus community. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Any, um, please feel free to raise your hand if you do have a question. I see Kim has a question. Go ahead, Kim. Hi. So a lot of times when we do events, we just put out an open call and saying, oh, we're doing an event and we could have the accessibility coordinator listed. But um, it's very rarely that people get back to us about like if they're going to attend an event because it's not a it's not like a, a meeting with a department, but it's just like we're doing this a panel and you know, it's it's for this group, but we're opening up for the entire campus or we're anybody who wants to come. And so we don't really know about like, what are we supposed to do about the accessibility for those kind of events? And they tend to be kind of on the smaller side because you can never tell how many people are coming. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what is your suggestions when it comes to things like that? Yeah, I, I think that as long as we have some information and a means by which people can communicate that they need an accommodation, we're moving in the right direction. So number one, our advertisement should include, if you need an accommodation, contact this person. Uh, and, and that's what we need to do. Um, in addition to that, when it comes down to how we're um, arranging our activities and arranging our services, every presenter can be provided with notes on how to make their events and their presentations accessible. So that can just be something that gets sent to everybody who's doing a presentation. Um, but other than that, I think having the messaging begin with notice, providing people with notice that if they want an accommodation, this is how you do it, is a great first step. And, and the, the bottom line is that we understand that um, sometimes people wait to the last minute, sometimes people aren't sure. Our goal is to make sure that if somebody requests that we have an opportunity to provide that service, we have an opportunity to make a good faith effort to provide that service and and we do it in a welcoming way um, does that mean that we do it 100 percent of the time and there aren't mistakes no that just we're, we're people it happens but the the goal is to make it so that we already have uh, education and 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 um, things in place to assist people in knowing what to do when it happens uh, does anyone else have a question I see Gillian has her or their hand raised. Go ahead, Gillian. Thank you so much. It's such great information. It's really, really helpful. My, I had a question about um, hosting Zoom events and making sure that the Q&A portion of the event is accessible. I'm not clear whether the raise hand Zoom function works for everyone um, who needs it to and putting things into the Q&A uh, window or into the chat window which is better. So I wonder if there's a resource that I could look up for that or if you have any thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Part of it is it's challenging and this is the intersection of different types of disabilities and their functional limitations and how best to make things accessible. Um, and so from one person's view, it may be that using the chat is much more comfortable for them for, for whatever reason. Right. And then another person's view is that using the chat can be an interruption. So for me, if I'm listening to somebody talk and somebody chats at the same time, my brain can hear both and make sense of neither. 
Um, and, and so for me, the interest is better served by me asking people to have a moderate, have them raise their hands and have a moderator speak. On the other hand, there be, may be another person involved in the meeting for which that method does not function, does not work. And I would not want it to be the case that they don't participate because they can only use the chat. I would prefer that they do use the chat. Um, so it's really not, it's really difficult to pin down and say, oh, you can do this and you can't do that. I think a better way for us to move forward is to, is to be open and flexible to the various ways that people can communicate and participate in the process. If a person can't raise their hand and they need to audibly speak or they need to use the, the chat, then I would prefer that they do so just so that they can participate. Um, but for me, uh, it, it's challenging in that I will be in meetings and sometimes the chat will be going like lightning and, and I can't hear anything about what the presenter is saying as a result of it. And so sometimes I'll announce, hey, can you not use the chat so much so that I can participate? But again, we're really talking about that intersection of how functional limitations for one um, may cause an issue in another person's ability to access content and participate. So I definitely understand the, the issue that you're raising. And I don't know that there's a, 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 a rule other than to say we want everybody to participate as they can and, uh, and go from there. Thank you so much, Derek. I actually have a question. So um, there are many details to making events accessible, obviously, and I'm curious as to whether if a student or other organization is putting on an informal event, such as a monthly meeting, are they required to make that accessible? Um, and it's kind of a two-part question. What about activity-based events, such as campus walks or tours? How can those be made accessible, and are they required to be accessible? Yes, they, they both are required to be accessible. So the, the, the first step in the process is, is there a, mechan a, a means by which a person can request an accommodation? So in, in, in one sense, the accommodation and the modification or adjustment to the activity is based on and dependent on uh, the accommodation that's being requested. Um, there are some units who want to make their events and activities completely and totally accessible, and, and I applaud them. Uh, but, um, but at the same time, we, we want to just make sure that we're uh, open and receptive to people who are actually requesting the accommodations. So if it's a, it's, if it's a monthly meeting that's taking place and they have a person who wants to have uh, the event captioned or have an ASL interpreter, then of course they have their announcement of the event and then there are the contact information so that they can request an accommodation. If it's a tour on campus or something like that, again, it's going to depend on what the accommodation request is. Uh, if it's a person who needs uh, mobility assistance, um, that's going to require that they contact our office and we talk through what that looks like. Um, for example, um, you, would, you would do an assessment and ask the person, well, ordinarily, how do you ambulate across distances? How do you travel from point A to point B? And then assess, you know, are there modifications or adjustments that need to take place in order for access to be provided? So ultimately, they all need to be made accessible, especially when there's a request that's come in for access to be uh, provided. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? Uh, I have one more. Yeah. yeah, one more question. How late can we put in a request if it comes to our knowledge that we need um, some accessibility? And um, what do we tell uh, folks if we cannot provide them because their request came in so late? Um, late is a big deal. Uh, it's stressful on the vendors. Uh, it's stressful on the process. And so we try our best to not have there be late requests. Um, some vendors uh, have um, people that become available, and sometimes they don't. Uh, I think in the past two years in this project, we probably have had less than 10 that have come in very late. And the vendors have worked really hard and diligently to provide access. And they haven't been successful in, it, in, in each instance, unfortunately. But uh, again, doing so can be stressful on the system. 
Um, so I, I think um, for, for that piece, we, we don't want to stress out our vendors, right? But we also want to provide access. The other piece of that is the people who are using the services, uh, if, unless they're adventitiously disabled and they've never used it before, they sort of understand that there needs to be some lead time to be provided in order for uh, access to be provided. Um, so when it comes down to not being able to provide access based on what someone's requested, we just do a good faith, uh, make a good faith effort to provide the service. And if we can't, then we just make sure we uh, write a record, create a record of what happened. So that let's say that the person is angry about it and they want to file a, a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights uh, and or the Department of Justice and claim that they were not accommodated. We want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what happened when the request came in, uh, the work that we did to uh, fulfill the request, etc. Um, at the end of the day, it's called reasonable accommodation. And that reasonable quote unquote part includes the time necessary to be able to schedule and arrange the services. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I was gonna ask that I answer your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it, great. it really does because- um, It's sad when we can't do it. So yeah, but, yeah sometimes it happens. And the last one is you were talking about graphs being hard. Well, we can't you can't see the graphs because they're um they're visual. Is there a good is does that website that you guys were sending us does that have a good um places where we can put in graphs or, or get some um language about how what to tell people um when we caption them? I don't have a resource for that right now, but I will definitely get a resource for that. Um, and uh, I was in a meeting earlier this week and graphs were being discussed. And in a sense, they do have to provide verbal descriptions of the data anyway, because everybody is not, uh, does not understand cross classification tables or, uh, or multiple regression R squares. You know? So at the end of the day, people do have to verbalize what people are looking at when they highlight discussing the graphs. So it's not difficult to ask them to provide a little more information about uh, what their main point is in communicating the purpose of the graph being used. Um, so I, I will find resources for that and make sure that they're included on our website. But I think a general rule would be when you're describing this graph to someone, how do you do it in words, which is what they really have to do anyway. Uh, the graphs are usually made to support a point that people are making. Uh, and, and it's really the point they're trying to make. And they're just using this method of providing uh, credibility to that point that they're trying to make. Thank you. I see um, Mark has his hand raised and also Ella. So we have two more questions. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, I have a question about at an event that takes uh, multiple places on campus, something like a, a Cal Day or maybe even a Summerfest. For people who are, have mobility uh, issues, is it the responsibility of the event coordinator or is it the responsibility of the individuals themselves to, uh, to arrange transportation such as like a loop car or you know, even an Uber or something if they had to? Uh, well, depends. So the loop card is for transportation internal to the campus and the Uber would be external to the campus. For the loop cart transportation, the person would need to register to use the loop cart through our office by going to the DAC website and requesting services and, uh, and get it being authorized to be able to use the, the service. Um, but, but the loop cart would be, you know, that service requires that they use an app to schedule what ride they want and uh, where they want to go to and from. So uh, in terms of being able to participate in those events, uh, that would be the process by which they would do that. Um, for Uber transportation, that would be completely external to the campus. And, uh, you know, that would be um, up, it would be up to them um, in terms of where they want to be dropped off uh, external to the campus 
um, to travel to the actual location. Uh, the event sponsor of these events can add to their website, you know, the website that they use to publicize the event can include information from um, our website, um, coming to events is the, is the website. Um, and they can include information on the resources that are available on campus, where to park, where disabled parking spots are located near and on the campus, et cetera. Shuttle buses, what their schedules are, how to find out information about uh, them so that they can be used. So uh, I, I think it's a partnership in that the event sponsor can provide information on how, uh, on what transportation option exists once they arrive to the campus and, and, and in terms of how to get to the campus. And, uh, and then the individual has a responsibility for uh, utilizing those options and exploring uh, which option works best for them to be able to reach the, the location. And that doesn't mean that they can't reach out to the event sponsor for more information. And we welcome that. Uh, and if the event sponsor doesn't know, they can always reach out to our office and, and we definitely welcome that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it is one o'clock. We do have one more question. So I just want to ask our administrator, our administrator, <laughs> administrative uh, people, if we have time to answer that one more question from Ella. It's, that's okay. Derek and I can always talk offline. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate your attendance. And um, thank you, Derek, for your amazing presentation. I learned so much from that. So thank hopefully you. we will see a lot more accessible events on campus going forward. And um, yeah, stay tuned for more webinars from the Alliance.